Great. Well, yeah, thank you very much for having me here today and for giving up your lunchtime. Hopefully, it'll be uh, interesting and a little bit inspiring. Um, so, uh, as, as Matt just said, we, we founded Field and Fowls um, at a similar stage to lots of, lots of you. Uh, well, although I, do, I don't know what range we have here. Who's, who's, who's in undergraduate here? Yeah. And uh, who's, any, anyone in, in diploma? No, nope. okay. So I'm, I don't know much about the University of West of England at the moment, but it's great to it's great to have you here. So we founded our practice uh, effectively, although not formally, when we were in our third year, because we graduated and we were we were offered the opportunity to take forward um, T Pren, which was our very first project. Uh, initially, up to planning, and um, of course, we weren't qualified architects, and so it took us about another six or seven years until. We became chartered and, uh, and all, all the rest of it. So uh, very early foundations and the kind of driving philosophy behind our practice initially was that we wanted to get as much built as early as possible. So today I will, let's just make sure this works, sorry, what's the, um, is it this one? Sorry, I'm just, uh, maybe it's just, I can just scroll. Just these ones? No, no, no. Yeah, I've tried those. <laughs> Sorry. Let me just make sure that it's... Uh, <laughs> double checked it. Yeah, it's a big file. Ah, which one? So, it's this... Ignore this keyboard. Yeah, it's all too high tech. Okay, great. Okay, so sorry. Um, over the technical hitches. Okay, so uh, this lecture is called The Particularities of Place, but actually I'm going to talk you through two domestic projects. Um, but all of our work is, is extremely uh, place specific, um, and we are kind of against the universalization of architecture and the influences of technology on, on, on making architecture more universal. So, uh, so our work is, is, is not, uh, every project is extremely bespoke, and, and you'll see that through, through these two projects. This is just a shot of some of our early, um, the early kind of range of work that we, that we had. So we've designed everything from very unglamorous structures such as garages and studios uh, through to houses, and then more recently we've been branching out into more cultural uh, and arts projects. So these are some of, the, some of the, the, the driving factors in our work, really. Um, people in place is always, is always core. Cool. We spend a lot of time immersing ourselves. Uh, it's become less, sadly, due to the pressures of, of other projects, but we still spend a lot of time uh, getting to know people through consultations uh, and trying to spend time on the place. And if we can't afford to have that time, then, we, then the consultations help serve, um, serve a purpose in understanding what it is about the local conditions. So prevailing conditions, um, we have a very rich material approach. Um, typology and subversion, you'll see how that, how that comes into our work. Um, and if you get a chance to read um, the Frampton uh, Critical Regionalism um, essay, then, then lots of those themes do kind of run through, run through our work. Um, you'll see that these two projects uh, have, have a very rich landscape context. And in general, our work uh, has a lot of, uh, we're often working in very sensitive settings. Um, culture is becoming more and more important. There's always the local culture, especially in, in smaller kind of domestic <coughs> projects, but we're now doing projects with the National Trust, Carlisle Cathedral, um, Yorkshire Sculpture Park, and some, some kind of broader organizations. Um, and then permanence and adaption. But I'll, I'll touch on these themes as we go through. So this is, uh, this is myself and Edmund in our first studio. Uh, it was quite a big step for us to, to take on a studio space. It was in Hackney. It was extremely cold. <laughs> it was extremely kind of raw. Uh, but, but effectively, we, we could afford a cheaper space by being, by being further out and, uh, and, and having, having the opportunity to have a workshop. So that's also been key to the way we work. We've always had a, a workshop, um, and, uh, and we make, we make an awful lot of <coughs> models. These are the two projects that I'll, I'll touch on today. So... Um, uh, or, or in a bit more detail. So T. Pren on the left, uh, and then this is uh, called the Cobb Barn on the right. 
So new build um, Welsh longhouse on the left and, and a very rich um, uh, cob and masonry and timber barn on the right. Um, so T. Pren, as I briefly said, came about after our part one. So we knew somebody who had a site. They, uh, they, 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 wanted to, they, they wanted to put initially just a, um, a single story bungalow on the site. Uh, it's extremely sensitive because the, the context is, um, is the Brecon Beacons National Park. So you can just about see, oh, I might have a, this is a pointer. Let's see whether, sorry. You can just about see, see the site up there in gray um, and in among this uh, very sensitive, beautiful setting. Um, overlooking, uh, overlooking Penny Fan and, um, and you'll find that every, well, we found that every single house in that area objected to the planning permission. So um, often with these sensitive settings, no one wants any change. So that was, that was one of the big challenges we had to overcome. Is it, is it working? Great. Lovely, thank you. Um, and the inspiration for, for our proposal was really looking at the Welsh longhouses and, and this very shallow, shallow plan um, buildings that, um, that were very heavyweight. And our interpretation of it was that actually we didn't want to create a very heavyweight building, but we, we did like, we, we were interested in the, in the longhouse form and the way that it worked with the topography and the fall of the slope. Um, Lots of the traditional buildings had very small windows, which were determined by daylight factors, um, and often, often only looking at about 100 lux. So that was, that was also to do with minimizing heat loss. But of course, we, we had the opportunity to, to create a much more sealed building and a much more high-performing building. And so, yeah, we started working through model. We started looking at how, this, how, how our proposal, you can see that that the, the, section, the section of this longhouse was embedded into the bank. Um, and then in the, in the north, uh, you can see this zone here. Sorry, I'm, I'm talking to this one mainly. So uh, you can see in, in the zone um, on the right hand side of that section that there's about a one meter, a one meter zone where we put all the services. And we, we started working through 1 to 20 models. In a way, we'd, we, we'd, just, we'd just done our part one. So we kind of treated this a bit like a student project. And, and now we look at it, and it's quite incredible how little time, relatively, we spend on projects compared to how we spent on, on, on this one. Um, but in a way, you know, whilst, whilst you're kind of cutting your teeth, it's very important to, 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 to learn, how, learn more about the process and how to, how to find efficiencies. So this, this zone all the way along the, along the top, which you can see highlighted in yellow, that ha that has, um, it has the pantry, it has the stair, it has um, two bathrooms, uh, and then it has all of, the, all of the heating elements for the house as well. Um, so quite a simple, kind of quite a simple modernist plan really, with all of, all, of the, um, all of the spaces, the habitable spaces, overlooking the views, facing south, and getting, um, gaining, as, gaining passive, um, gaining passive solar benefit. Um, one of the key things was the client. So again, trying to understand people and, and the place, the client um, was very passionate about timber because he was an arboriculturalist. He had managed woodlands for a long time. And so we wanted, we wanted to use that expertise. And one of the things that excited us was the idea of having a log burning stove within the building that could then use the cladding after 20 to 30 years um, to heat the house, and we would plant the trees at the start of at the start of the project, and they'd be on this cycle. So, so, so he was happy to plant 15 larch trees at the start of the project, and after 25 years, the idea is that that we can we can fell those and reclad reclad the timber. So, so that cycle was was quite interesting. We explored various timber frames, but um, at this point, we actually decided to, to, to build this one out of SIPS panels. Um, it's the only building we've ever built entirely out of SIPS panels, and in a way, we've maybe perhaps become more purist over time, because um, SIPS panels, so structural insulated panels, they have, um, they have extruded um, insulation um, <coughs> between the two, the two OSB faces, so in that respect, they're, they're not as green as some other types of insulation. But the benefits are it's extremely lightweight, 
can be erected in virtually no time, uh, and, uh, and then you have an extremely sealed building. So I'll just flick through these. So that, 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 those are the SIPs panels going up, and it's, it's quite a terrifying process when you're on site because there's, there's a load of guys with nail guns um, firing these panels together, and <laughs> you just feel like you're in a kind of a war zone because it's going up so quickly. So it took about three weeks for, for the building to, to go up. Uh, and that's, that's the view over Penny Fan, and uh, that's pretty much due south from, from the site. Um, the key people involved in this, this, this guy you can see here, um, his name was Doug, he was the, the local roofer. Um, he had all sorts of knowledge, again, about the climate and about the detailing of, of the slate and how we, could, how we could put these lead soakers in and lap them behind, behind the larch. So even though every project he had been involved in had been extremely kind of traditional to this point, we said, look, we're, we're really trying to push for, for very flush eaves and we want really crisp, um, <coughs> extruded, um, contemporary form. He was also very good at, at, at working with us on blending the, um, blending the, the new slate and um, recycled slate. So there was a combination of slate used in this project which gave the project a much richer kind of patina and a kind of... Um, a depth of history that sometimes contemporary materials um, struggle to achieve or depending on how they're detailed it, it, sometimes new buildings can become rather a bit, bit more soulless. So this is the larch which we were using um, and we used a wood miser on site so we developed the, the, the sectional profile with the, with the main contractor. The main contractor was just again he was just a local guy who had, who had one mate who helped him and uh, uh, and and so we were able to we were able to be there whilst this was being done and actually try out the spacing of the of the cladding and make sure that actually um, we we achieved something that that kind of that reflected the concept. So this is this is the cladding going up. Um, the building control officer didn't want it to be as kind of filigree as we wanted. We wanted the the spacing to be quite wide, and the, and the initial concept was for the larch to wrap right the way over the roof and down the north wall. But the building control officer was quite rightly probably saying that actually the climate here is so, so harsh and the prevailing winds will mean that it, it will take such a battering. So, so we, we, we tightened up the spacing quite considerably. Um, it still breathes. Uh, and then we've, we've got these, um, these vertical studs where we ran lots of the services. So, um, so within those we had our down pipes um, we could have uh, any, of the, any of the exposed electrics we needed for external lighting and, and those kind of aspects. And then we just had these uh, very simple lead, uh, lead sills um, lapping, lapping down over, over the large. And, uh, and it's quite agricultural in some respects in its aesthetic. So, so you can just see there's a recess here in the large, and that's because we had these huge, great sliding solar shades. Um, so they're just manually operated, and they're on... Um, they're on uh, barn, barn door um, sliders. So, um, so really quite basic. And at this stage, you know, we, were, we, were, we were working very closely with the contractor to develop the details. Now, of course, especially with big projects, the whole lot's fully designed before you go out. And, but actually having those early conversations or choosing the key people, um, suppliers will always do that, but, uh, but actually you want to kind of be, be speaking to the people who are going to be constructing it and making sure that it's all... It's all feasible. Uh, very simple flush um, eaves that we had, um, and then uh, and then this is before the north wall went up inside. So you can see, so that that whole zone became enclosed, and that's the void for the stair. Um, the, the the way this this building's heated is was quite interesting. So we have no gas boiler, um, and we have. The, this, is, these, this is the only real heat source, so it's, it's a log burning stove with a, back, with a back boiler on it and that's then combined with um, solar collectors on the roof and the whole lot feeds into this accumulator tank and then it redistributes it through under, underfloor heating but only on the ground floor because it's such a, it's such a heavily sealed building that actually we didn't need to have, um, we didn't need to have a, a, gas, a gas boiler. So that's quite nice and part of that again is it's part of our approach that we like kind of hands-on architecture. We like, we like the, the idea that actually if people are going to be putting energy into their house, it's not something that's divorced from them. So again, like with the sliding shutters and, 
and then in, in the summer the way that it's all passively cooled just through cross ventilation and some stack ventilation so so that people actually kind of interact more with their with their environment um, and then that gets enclosed in the north, in the north wall uh, and then there's just a few finished shots of the project um, so this is all uh, birch face ply along the <coughs> along the north wall um, and then a combination of stone and timber floors. Um, one really nice thing, there's a great company called Tim Hour Lime, which you may have come across, but they're, they're based very locally, and we use them for the lime-based plasters and the lime paints. And one of the really nice things about that is, is the whole building smells incredible when you paint it. It's all quite, it's, it's, it's really kind of wholesome, so it's, it's very nice. Um, as it was our first project, we had relatively um, kind of, we little experience with the interiors and so that's something which has developed quite a lot in the practice since this point but to kind of pitch ahead of yourselves as it were because there's often there's often it's often the newest or the biggest job but you haven't done one of those and some clients say so show me show me one of these and it's always very bespoke so you, you, you normally can't show them that so you say well these are this is the approach this is how we're going to tackle this this is why we've got the skills or where we've got the deficiencies and where we've got those, we're going to bring somebody in and we know this person who's excellent. So I think that, um, I think it's, we, we try to have a kind of very open practice and uh, be, be very honest about the way that we approach our architecture. And I think that's, that, that's really important. And, and a collaborative approach means that any potential weaknesses you might have, you can, you can fill them and actually kind of form a much stronger team. So this is, a, this is a project, as I say, near Bude. It's a, it's a cob barn um, in a very sensitive uh, planning setting again. Um, this is looking towards Bude and, and out, over, um, out towards the Atlantic. Um, and there was this collection of three buildings. So there was a farmhouse, there was an, uh, the oldest barn, which was a masonry barn, and then a small uh, red brick barn. So they lived in the main house, and then they, they had already developed the Red, the red barn. Um, cob is an amazing material. It's incredibly green. Um, it's basically uh, earth with some straw, some sand, uh, and it's uh, it, th there's a few people in the southwest who are really excellent at building with cob. Um, there's different ways of, of building with cob, but the way that we chose to extend this was using cob blocks. So they were kind of um, they were they were made on site. They had to dry out for a while. It, it's a, it's a breathable material, so it's a, it's a bit like rammed earth in that it, it soaks up a lot of moisture <coughs> and gives it back out. Um, but it does mean you don't build like, uh, you, like you do with contemporary buildings. You don't want a, a hermetically sealed box. So we had to put copper pipes through the walls because I'll show you in a moment that we ended up with a double skin. So we let that all breathe. Um, and, uh, and, and we wanted to express the different, the different kind of layers and history of this building. So uh, the existing building the, was first of all constructed in masonry. It had been extended in cob, which was quite common um, because it's very cheap, or it certainly used to be a very cheap building material when labor was cheap um, and the materials were free. Um, and then we also added another layer, which was in, uh, in timber. And any of our new insertions were made using precast concrete. Um, one thing they say about cob is that they, they likes to have good boots or ha have good boots and a good hat because effectively if water is coming up from below it will start to erode or if, it, if you don't have the right eaves then again it starts to, it, it'll start to wash away. Um, but the existing walls, one of the things we really loved about it was that they had kind of a striation from the, from the driving rain. Uh, so these are these are the kind of the key kind of inserts that that we made. So uh, there was a, effectively a timber frame that we sat inside the building, um, and the engineers we worked with who are called Momentum. They're, they're from Bath. They're fantastic engineers. They they suggested setting setting our foundations inbound and then cantilevering the slab out so that we had minimum kind of intervention with the existing walls. And just really simple little elements like that, you know, can make a project. So um, certainly financially they can, because you, you, you're not faffing about with the existing foundations as much. So, and then we introduced this clear story, which ran on both sides. So again, just articulating this, this new roof that we were placing on top. Um, so the stone, concrete, and cob, 
and then these are the, some of the precast sills when they arrived on site and they were all made by uh, Cornish concrete. Um, you can see the different, the different layers here of it going up and, and the, uh, you can see those cob blocks near the, near the doorway and then on top of that a flick coat was applied so literally flicked by hand and so it's very kind of lots of it's very hand, handmade and kind of um, uh, crafted. Uh, simple plan working with the existing strange cranked form and adding a little extended kitchen uh, and that's one of the finished shots. Um, so, uh, trying to kind of keep keep the construction as cheap as possible. So this is just um, board and batten larch cladding, um, and then we've got this uh, we've got the tapering clear story, uh, and then these big picture frame windows inserted. And and the taper and the crank, I I really love the, the way that it that the, that the light from the south. You read the different depth of, of construction and lots of the lots of the subtlety and I mean I I think that for me lots of lots of these elements they're kind of they come together to create quite a kind of poetic kind of experiential architecture that has that has a richness that um, that that's quite hard to hard to achieve. Um, so I'll 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 quickly talk you through what what these led on to and then I'll leave hopefully I'll leave a little bit of time. For, for some questions. So this is this is a project much closer um, closer to home or closer to here. This is in Bath. It's a school called Ralph Allen School. Um, we started working with them in 2010. I went there for sixth form. It's a it's a local uh, state school that had grown up uh, through little piecemeal interventions. So the way that education funding comes about is often you can apply to the government for a classroom or an extension, and so. The, the whole plan of the site had been eroded and we said actually, okay, we, we, we need to step right back and try and impose a kind of a strict rational um, diagram on the site. So we've got a kind of community third, we've got the main school and the majority of the teaching services and then we subdivided the site the other way as well. Um, and the very first project we did there is, uh, is a project called, well it was called the Applied Learning Centre or the Lee Centre. Uh, and so this was funded by the local authority. Um, it's, uh, it was a design and build project um, in a really kind of key pivotal point on the site. So there's a main road which passes by uh, the current school or the, the previous school kind of presence was, uh, was, was kind of fragmented and apologetic. So we wanted to introduce more of a civic presence to the building um, and, and allow uh, allow there to be yeah, just a much greater sense of civic pride. And the location of this building didn't just form a cornerstone, but it also was setting the tone for the future phases in that it was, uh, it was built on the green in the green belt, uh, or certainly in terms of planning terms, they said, no, this is a green belt site, even though it's a major existing developed site. Uh, and we also put in an all-weather pitch at the same time at the other end of the site. So we were, we were trying to kind of frame the future phases of development at the school. Um, so it's quite quite a simple plan, but the the levels in a way are what what make the project. So we've got this hub space in the in the centre, so that's the double the double height space there, and then we've got these pairs of classrooms le leading onto the hub space. And the nature of education buildings is that they they change their program quite regularly. So different successive governments will come in and bring different different teaching methods. Sometimes uh, sometimes it's all about um, interdependent learning, sometimes it's much more about having, having a lead lesson in a larger space and breaking out. At the moment, the, the current administration is kind of pushing a very straightforward classrooms. So there's, there's two blocks which we did here and they have, they have quite a different character as a result. So this building was designed more around a, uh, a kind of university style of learning. Um, so lots and lots of breakout spaces, lots of different scale spaces for individuals to work, pairs, small groups, um, and extremely porous as well. So there's lots of visual connections through the building. Um, there's, uh, there's, yeah, there's really good clear sight lines, passive supervision. Um, and again, that just helps, that, that allows, allows the school to use it in a, in a much more grown up way. So talking about timber frames, we have um, a cross laminated uh, timber structure. So again, all prefabricated. Um, the, the whole frame weighed about 200 tons, so 
that's, um, that's quite a lot of carbon that we're locking in through carbon sequestration into, into the building, into the, the form of the building. Um, and the nice thing about, or one of the nice things about working with CLT is there's a stage where it feels like a, a model that you would make at university, where it's very raw. And we wanted to, to leave lots of, these, um, lots of these surfaces exposed. We also uh, introduced a rammed earth wall because it was uh, to be a, um, an applied learning center for science was the first brief. So we wanted all the materials to be very tangible and that people could, could touch them and could, you could understand and read how the building was, was, was put together. So this was all using, um, using material off the site and using the labs up at Bath University and there, um, there's a guy called Pete Walker who's kind of world expert on rammed earth and so we, we were able to do some trials, talk to the school about the tones and make sure that they, they were happy with what they were going to receive. Um, this is the other. This is the, this is the kind of south side of the building, look at, looking at it from from the new building that we built. Um, so there's, there there are an awful lot of themes, and one of the one of the difficulties is sometimes trying to sum up complex buildings into 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 a sentence or two. So um, this building. So I won't try and sum it up, but instead, you know, this building is about these shifting masses. You can see that there's this um, that both both levels link out into the landscape, so it's the accessible school for the area. So it's really important that that the, that this building should be demonstrating best practice. So um, we then had there's the, there are kind of pavilion <laughs> pavilion like qualities to it. We have this sweet chestnut cladding uh, at high level, um, and then we had this this heavier base. Um, that was that was going to be um, all in precast um, concrete panels, but in the end, it, it, they, they were also stained timber. But in, again, you know, it's quite nice to push a theme. So this building is all about, it's really all about timber again. So that that was quite nice. It's got wood fiber insulation, um, uh, and and the whole thing is is kind of breathable. Uh, that's the rammed earth wall and some of the interiors. Um, and that's the that's the the roadside. So you can see this this approach to it up up the left hand side there. And there's these kind of deep cuts into the building, which signify um, entry points and and gathering points where you can shelter from the weather. Um, sorry, and uh, and and approach into the building. And and actually everything. So the rhythm here. So it's all set out on a 1.2 meter grid. That's partly down to the cross laminated timber um, module, and then also tying that in with the window module. Uh, and we're often trying to kind of find um, key axes through a building where you read the landscape beyond and you have a connection, so both from internally but also externally, so you have a sense of what's there. So this was the first building, and now just behind this next shot, this is the second building which we did there, um, and, uh, and this is called the Rose Building, again in cross-laminated timber, but this is, this is designed to um, Michael Gove's baseline design standards for schools, which you'll find uh, most architects are fairly um, appalled by because it tries to squeeze out any opportunity for design and, uh, and, and those in-between spaces where actually we normally find that half the learning goes on. So, so the, the, the construction budget for this was extremely tight, but we wanted to kind of subvert that slightly. So we worked really hard at, um, at making, making the frame do more than just support the building. So we have these very large uh, glue lamb beams coming through the structure and then they suspend this walkway so that so that meant that we reduced our footprint so our foundations it did mean that they've got external um, circulation which some people um, may approve of and some may, may may not but it meant that when we were bidding to the educational funding agency there were opportunities to make the building uh, to kind of apply for the funding for the whole footprint and then focus the budget into uh, into a little area. One, one thing which is really interesting is that our consultations with students is that um, normally the, most of the school students we've spoken to, they don't necessarily, they don't have very kind of, um, their aspirations are more about identity than necessarily kind of fancy design. So we've often found that the things that they love about the buildings are things which they can identify or that have a name. So this red stair, they, they, that's, that's the element that they love most about both projects because it, it, they all call it the red stair, and it's just, it's, um, it's also, it's a bit more playful. So we're just trying to kind of introduce a little bit of joy into otherwise what could be 
um, what could be a very kind of simple, um, well, very low budget buildings, really. Um, and and this was constructed in um, in seven months, so it was it was a really tight uh, tight program. So. I'll try, sorry, I did say I'll try and leave some time, so I'll try and quickly rattle through a few others. This is a, this is a project called Hazel Grove, which is a, a very different type of school, which came off the back of the Lee Centre. Um, so this is this is a, a prep school in Somerset, um, actually a similar budget, but a much more heavyweight building, um, and and in a way kind of pushing slightly different different themes. It's for younger children, so it's actually we could be a bit more refined about the, some of the finishes. Um, schools for secondary schools, secondary um, age children are uh, they're, they're unbelievably kind of robust. You know, they, you'll find that the buildings take an absolute kicking, and um, and so that was something which we were trying to trying to avoid. Um, I thought I had a few more slides here, but actually we've only got about another nine minutes, so. I might um, I might hold it there and give you guys an opportunity because you, you might have hopefully you might have some burning questions. I'll leave it on a on a on a better slide. Okay. Uh, what gave you the motivation to uh, jump straight into uh, getting your own contracts and stuff? You said you were in your third year. Uh, sorry, yeah, we were in our third year yeah, of university. Yeah, so we were offered this. We were somebody, there was somebody that we knew who said, I want, to, I want to build a house in this location. Would you be interested in taking it up to planning? So he had just used, he had used a different, a different um, architect um, previously who hadn't really offered any inspiration. So it started from somebody saying, well, I might, I might be interested. He didn't say, you've got, the, you've got the kind of contract. So we went along and I think... Every time we've been given a half opportunity, we've tried to prepare as well as possible. So we always take a series of precedents. Now, of course, we take examples of our work. But we were really prepared, really excited and fired up. And I think, thankfully, he, he, he saw that. And he said, well, let's, let's give it a go. So, yeah. Hi. Uh, people, um, that question, when mm. you, you said you got the trust from clients mm. in the first project, um, in my experience, Mm. On site, was there a sort of um, fear of lack of respect from the contractors or anything like that? Yeah, I think I, th I think there always is. I mean, I think yeah. there's there's often a tension between architects and contractors. So, um, the what we what we found is that we were we were trying to push much more contemporary architecture than than the local contractors had delivered. Um, but there was. There was, a, I mean, it was a kind of jovial thing, you know. So they they were aware of our lack of experience, but equally we we tried to prepare as well as possible, so that every time we we came up against those situations, we'd research the subject or the, all the most of half the information out there is available. The other thing which we've always done is we've used external consultants when we can. So sometimes somebody who's a retired architect or something to to have a look over the scheme. So we've there's there's two. Um, there's two people we employ who are both retired, both kind of interested in, in architecture. One of them is actually a civil engineer, one of them is an architect. And we just, we, we try and have, we try and be very kind of open about where our, where our strengths are and, and our weaknesses. So um, that's been really helpful. Yeah. And actually you'll find, you know, you'll find that generally within architecture, there is a good community. You know, ex-tutors, friends, people who are a few years above you. There's, there are so many, there's so many different routes. But I think if you, if you're open and you and, and you say, actually, I'm not going to pretend that I, I know everything, but I, but I know where where I'm, where I've got strengths and weaknesses, then it can be quite productive. Uh, yes, sorry, and then to sorry. Um, how do you deal with how did you deal with the liability of the project not being chartered at that time? Uh, so it wasn't a problem getting professional indemnity, um, surprisingly. So we've always had uh, a level of professional indemnity insurance, but um, we we also said to the client, you know, we're not we're not chartered, we're not fully qualified. Um, and I think he was he was reassured by the fact that we said, but you know, we 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 are going to speak to our old tutor. You know, there are there are various people just to make certain that we're that we're doing the right things. So. Um, uh, Ed, my business partner, his um, his uncle was an architect, and he 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 also went to this area sometimes. So we went with him sometimes. So there were there were ways around that, yeah. And um, 
and initially I think we were using a consultant form of appointment. So, well, in fact, we initially we wrote our own form of appointment um, because we, we couldn't use any of the RVA stuff. Then later we found we could use the consultant form of appointment. And then when we finally qualified, we started using all the RBA standard forms of appointment. But, but we, were, we were pretty scared about getting all that stuff wrong. So we, we tried our absolute damnedest to make sure that we always knew where the kind of risks and liabilities were. So, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, c coming out of education and going into... Um, your, uh, the, um, the firm. Uh, you're yeah. doing the actual work for other people that actually got built. Yeah. So we, we worked in... Um, um, if, I, if I don't answer your question properly, then, then ask it again in a second. But we, work, we worked for other people um, in between times. So, um, so uh, Ed did four years on and off with Hopkins. Um, I did less, I did probably, I did about a year with Howarth Tompkins and then I did a, a year with Cabe. But whilst we were doing that, we were kind of, we were, we were busy trying to kind of set up the practice. And what, I think what often happens is that people kind of clone lots of the systems that they're, that of, the, of the bigger practices that they're working in. Um, I think one of, the, one of the kind of, one of the advantages of doing it young was being really, really naive. <laughs> and, and naive and enthusiastic. Um, but just a kind of self-belief that actually, if I'd known all of the risks, and I mean, if somebody said to you, right, the next five years are going to be financially brutal, you, you'd be kind of slightly more nervous. So that said, I think, I think that, you know, we, we did it particularly young. So there were, we were probably more naive, even if, we'd, even if we'd done it a few years later and spoken to other people who'd been there, it might have, might have been a bit different. So, um, but always, I mean... I, I, I've always said to people who are thinking about setting up, well, come and talk to us, or don't talk to us, but talk to somebody else who's done it. You know, just make sure that you're not, don't believe that you, you know everything and reinvent the, the wheel, because actually all the knowledge is kind of out there. So, right. Right. Any more questions? Actually, in line with that, there's a really good book that the um, RIBA published last year called 21 Things You Don't Learn Architecture School. Mm. So it's worth um, picking that up. Brilliant. Okay, thank you, folks. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.